Good afternoon and welcome to the City Club of Cleveland. I'm Hugh McKay, President of the Board of Directors of the City Club. Cleveland has historically been a city widely known for the strength of its immigrant communities and we have a rich tradition of attracting people from not only around the country but from all around the world. This has historically been a key to Cleveland's strength and, and our growth in the past. Uh, but in our ever-changing world, how now does Cleveland and the region maintain this attractiveness to people who have a wide world of choices of where to visit and where to call home? And what can we do to make sure that Cleveland is a go-to place for people all over the world, not to merely visit but to live and work here? And what do we need to do to restore, enhance our reputation and stature uh, as international friendly, as an international destination, and as economically attractive uh, for people from all over the world? These questions are being aggressively and effectively addressed by Global Cleveland, uh, a great organization founded just a year ago with support from across the community, including an especially generous and substantial grant from Huntington Bank, as well as support from the Cleveland Foundation, Four City Enterprises, the Jewish Federation, uh, working with the Cleveland Council on World Affairs, and other uh, engaged uh, citizens of the community. Global Cleveland is doing much to foster the vibrant and dynamic spirit of Cleveland as an international city on the move and a city to which people want to move. We have an excellent panel assembled here today to discuss these issues. Raju Shaw is the, the board chair of Global Cleveland and as his day job he works as CEO of Bio Enterprises. Dan Walsh is treasurer of Global Cleveland and he's president of Huntington Bank's Greater Cleveland Region. Uh, Michael Byron is executive director of Asian Services in Action. The president of Global Cleveland is Larry Miller. And Andrew Bennett is co-chair of Engage Cleveland, which is connecting and empowering young professionals in the community. Now, uh, Baiju Shah will serve as moderator and uh, will lead our discussion here as we learn more about Global Cleveland's exciting first year uh, and where we go from here. Uh, Baiju? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Hugh, and thank you to all of you for joining us here uh, this afternoon for this important discussion that we frame as really the talent attraction imperative for Cleveland. A hundred years ago, as the City Club opened its doors, Cleveland was in a very different position from a talent attraction perspective. We were a magnet for talent from all around the country as well as, as Hugh noted in his remarks, all around the world. A hundred years later, as we're celebrating the City Club's centennial, we're starting to get a, re a sense of the palpable revitalization of Cleveland. You can sense it in the downtown activity that's occurring just outside of these doors. You can sense it in the amount of innovation and entrepreneurship and business growth that's occurring throughout the region. Yet in spite of that, we're not the talent magnet that we were 100 years ago. And what we've assembled for you this afternoon is a panel of four of my colleagues to talk a little bit about our situation and some of the new initiatives that they have launched and are planning to launch over the course of the next year and years to come to address this important uh, imperative. We'll start with just a word of introduction from each of our panelists about who they are and their organization and their mission, and then we'll dive into the discussion. I'm gonna start with Andrew Bennett, the co-chair of Engage Cleveland. Andrew. Hi everybody, uh, great to meet you all. Uh, my name is Andrew Bennett and I'm uh, a boomeranger. I'm originally from here and went to university school, K through 12 and then I went to Elon University in North Carolina and had no intention of ever coming back to Cleveland. Um, <laughs> but once I did, I came back here in 2008, I discovered a Cleveland I never knew existed and became uh, you know, dedicated and committed to the city and um, hugely passionate about it. And what I'm doing now and I've been doing for the last year and a half is working on an initiative called Engage Cleveland, which is a community initiative to put organization and structure around 20,000 plus young professionals who want to be involved in the community but currently have no organization or place to help them do that. And uh, it's been a pleasure working with the Global Cleveland team and, and it'll be fun uh, launching this initiative in the, the coming months. Great. Thank you, Andrew. And so for young professionals looking to get engaged, especially to the tables on my left, <coughs> see Andrew afterwards. Um, mindset. It's mindset. That's right. It's all about the mindset. 
<laughs> Next to Andrew, we've got uh, Michael Bion. Michael is the Executive Director of Asian Services in Action. Good afternoon, everyone. Again, I'm Michael Bion with Asia Inc. Um, Asia was founded in 1995 by four Asian immigrant women who recognized there was a huge need for services and assistance to newly arriving Asian Americans and Pacific Islanders to this Northeast Ohio region. And since then, our services have really expanded and grown to address the broad array of services needed by our communities. And annually, we serve over 8,000 people. Um, my story here, in terms of how I got to Ohio, I'm actually a transplant from Seattle. So um, over the last 10 years that I've been here, I've noticed a tremendous change in growth and positive change in growth, especially among the Asian immigrant and refugee communities. And so I'm really excited to share a little bit more about that later today. Thank you, Michael. Thanks to Michael, we have Larry Miller. Larry Miller is the president of Global Cleveland. Larry. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm uh, delighted to be here with you uh, today. I'm the president of Global Cleveland, and Global Cleveland is an organization, as you've heard, that is trying to drive the uh, growth of our region and the success of our local businesses uh, by attracting 100,000 new residents and talented individuals to Northeast Ohio uh, by 2020. Uh, I am almost a lifetime Clevelander. I moved to Cleveland from uh, Texas when I was uh, seven years old. Uh, I have lived here uh, the entire uh, rest of my life except for 10 years I spent uh, living outside the United States in France and uh, um, Italy. And I've been, a, before I came to Global Cleveland, I was the head of human resources at Lubertal Corporation and a number of other organizations uh, prior to that in Northeast Ohio. Thank you, Larry. And then last but not least is uh, my friend Dan Walsh. Uh, Thanks, Beju, and thank you again. Good afternoon, everybody. Dan Walsh from uh, Huntington Bank, the president of the Greater Cleveland Region. Uh, I, too, am a boomeranger like Andrew. Uh, came back about 15 years ago. Grew up here in, in the Cleveland area. Uh, went to college here. Uh, went away to Chicago for a couple of years. Uh, married, came back. So uh, also a boomeranger. Thrilled to be here. And um, it's been, uh, as the other, uh, my colleagues talked about, the, the palpable resurgence, renaissance that's occurring right now is so exciting to be part of and uh, just really honored to be part of, uh, of uh, helping lead that effort here in our city. Great, thank you. So let's start into the discussion. Um, Dan, let me start with you around sort of talent attraction. I mean, from your perspective as this head of a major financial institution, why is talent attraction important to the region? Sure. Well, you think about it, Global Cleveland is an economic development engine around uh, talent attraction and retention. So as a, as, a, as a business, there's really three major things we look at. One is attracting or retaining talent here in town. And I think one of the big opportunities for a lot of companies is to create relationships with a lot of universities here to create a talent pipeline, make sure we're retaining a lot of the talent that's already here, something we've done and encourage other companies to do. Um, similarly, there's an attraction piece to it uh, to continue to also pour in innovative thinking from around the country and around the world uh, to help really lead this resurgence and shape our future and make sure there's enough um, people here uh, to, uh, to really uh, make sure we achieve the future that we all know we can uh, achieve. I would say the other thing really is about customers. You know, I think about the introductory comments around the fact that we really are uh, having this renaissance that, you know, comes back after 100 years of a lot of great institutions like the City Club and the Cleveland Foundation that are now celebrating the 100th anniversary. Um, we are at that moment again. It is Cleveland's time, I think, to seize that moment. And so to the extent we can um, uh, have, you know, we have all the physical things we need. We have another $7 billion in new investment. We just need more people, more people to uh, come to the city club, to open bank accounts, to, uh, <laughs> to join different uh, organizations in town, um, and to you know, support all the great cultural institutions that are here. Great. And Andrew, you talked a little bit about the young professionals, the 20,000 young professionals. Dan talked about innovation. So, from your perspective, why, what is important about the young professional movement as it relates to innovation and to, into the region's yeah, revitalization? I would say um, a large part about it is about the experiences and how they grew up and the skill sets that they now have around innovation and entrepreneurship and their school, they're uh, full, of, full of potential to help this city. So if we bring them here, the current companies can help be re-energized by them. They can start new companies. Uh, if you look at Ohio City as an example, an area that used to be relatively um, you know, quiet, not many people went there, and now it is this booming area with 11 different bars, and that was because of entrepreneurs and young people and development and these, these small shops where you had young people being able to run with their, kind of their dream of starting a business. And so 
with that innovation and that passion and the proactive mentality, they're able to really help this city and push it forward. And so I think they, uh, they can bring in a mentality that continues to uh, kick Cleveland forward and uh, force it to always be proactive. And Michael, from your perspective, you talked a little bit about working with the Asian communities, the recent migrants uh, to the region as well as refugees. How do they fit into this uh, talent attraction imperative for the region? I think uh, one great thing to share with you all is a recent um, book that Richard Herman, our local Richard Herman, had put together um, discussing kind of the growth in, of entrepreneurial activities in the Silicon Valley and a disproportionate a high, la large number of them being driven by immigrants as in leadership. So I think really it's important from an immigrant refugee perspective the need to have cultural diversity in a community. If you look at the metrics of prospering, economically flourishing communities across the country, um, diversity is an important factor and immigrants and refugees are an important factor of that diversity. And much like the Ohio City situation, you've got sections of town just like in decades or centuries past where immigrant communities move in, take over areas that have been abandoned by other groups and are revitalizing. So talk a little bit about Asia Town. Yeah, we're really excited about the tremendous change and growth in Asia Town, which is just down the street from here. And one good example of just the turnout we received in, for this year's Cleveland Asian Festival, over a two-day period, we had over 45,000 people attend. And it was a really amazing experience. Not only it showed um, our communities the, the, the great diversity in the food, culture, and activities, but also showed the welcoming sense of this community here in Greater Cleveland. Um, and, you know, there's a lot of amazing... Um, initiatives driven by individuals that are coming here and you know, developing in the Asia Town area uh, without a lot of uh, outside or external planning like community development entities supporting that. So it really speaks to the energy and the, and, and the initiatives of the community in that area. So. If I could add on to that real quick, um, a couple of weeks ago I was quoted in the Plain Dealer as having a girlfriend from Kosovo. And is that still true? That is still true. <laughs> and it go, and it's, it's going great. And um, why I bring that up is because over the last two years, being around her and her family, they bring a perspective that is so vastly different than what I have experienced here. And it's you know about community development and walking and culture and the arts. And so bringing more people with a diverse background can really be beneficial to the community. So it's this about, so what I'm hearing is it's this contribution of energy, it's this contribution of ideas, the contribution of different cultural perspectives that is important, talents that are important. To, Larry, uh, Global Cleveland has set a goal for 100,000 individuals coming into this region over the next decade, and Global Cleveland, through obviously its partners, is working now diligently towards that goal. Talk a little bit about setting that goal. What was important in terms of that number you know, what's important in terms of that number's impact on the community? The number was actually set before I came on board, but uh, the process that led to it uh, was, as I understand it, looking at the historical trends of um, changes in population in the, in the region and the needs uh, for the replacement of talent uh, in the region given the demographics of people leaving the state, people retiring, those kinds of things, and basically uh, came up with this objective that we had lost significant amounts of population uh, and um, you know, established this 100, we wanted it to be a meaningful uh, number that we'd be able to measure uh, as part of the census. So that's where the, the 100,000 uh, number comes from, which sounds like um, uh, uh, you know, a very high uh, and difficult goal, but um, we're very positive about it, we're very enthusiastic about it, and we're very confident that we're going to be able to make it happen. Yeah, yeah just uh, on, on that point, you know, if you think about, um, if you look at the, the U.S. population growth during the last census period, the last 10 years, it grew a little around 9%. Mm -hmm. And so, uh, you know, ours unfortunately declined. So the, uh, if you look at the amount of growth to get to 100,000, we kind of round it up. That would uh, equate to about 50,000 in growth just to keep up with the national average for us. So we said let's double it. Cleveland's a competitive town. Um, let's, let's double it and set a goal for ourselves that we can achieve so we actually start to grow faster than the national average, which I think is uh, an important part of it. Part of the context also that was set around the issue that a lot of employers are facing in our region, the, 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 the I think surprising issue of jobs that are hard to fill. So Larry, I know that you've pulled some numbers just this right. morning. Talk a little bit about the number of jobs that are out there and the types of employers and okay. what's the... 
So against the backdrop, uh, Beiju, of you know, the goal of 100,000, if you go to the state of Ohio's Ohio Means Jobs uh, website uh, today, they'll tell you in the last 30-day period, Northeast Ohio employers have uh, put online job ads uh, out on the internet for 90,000 jobs. And uh, if you talk to uh, employers as we do on a regular basis, a number of employers will tell you that uh, a lot of those uh, job ads have been out there for a long time. They are for positions that uh, they're having a very hard time finding talent. Uh, some of the uh, highest ranked positions on that list are for roles like nurses, uh, for customer service representatives, for people working in manufacturing plants, uh, IT, uh, uh, people who have IT background, IT skills. Uh, and also people with uh, financial and cons uh, consulting experience. So um, we, uh, in talking to uh, employers, we're very convinced that, uh, you know, there is a need out there and there's um, a lot of opportunity for employment. Andrew and, and Michael, a um, hundred years ago, we were in a similar situation. And Cleveland had this growing industry base, lots of open positions, and somehow the market worked individuals showed up from around the country or around the world to Cleveland. Why isn't the market working now, especially in these challenging times? I mean, Andrew, your peer group across the country is largely uh, underemployed mm -hmm. in terms of recent college graduates. Why aren't they flocking to Cleveland, to these jobs? That's a good question. I think uh, what a statistic is three out of four young professionals, people under the age of 28, first pick a place to move and then go find a job. And while Cleveland is starting to get better and booming, and there's still a reputation out there that Cleveland's not exactly a desirable location to be, once you actually come here, you find that it, to be the other way around. It's a fantastic place, but we're still combating a negative reputation, so people are still a little hesitant to move here. Um, in addition to that reputation, I think also the local universities were, you know, they're doing a fantastic job, but we're also losing a lot of students to other cities and not keeping them here. So if we're able to keep them here and we're able to help with that reputation, you can change it very quickly. I mean, look at Portland. It be went from kind of down in the dumps to one of the most popular cities in America. And so repu reputation can change pretty quickly. And as I think as you do that, then you'll see a big boost of people trying to move here. Michael, please. Yeah, along the same, li same line as what Andrew had mentioned in terms of from the international students community who are largely here studying, I mean, they're dying to get into positions or opportunities here locally, but the fundamental challenge is, is that many co corporations, especially the small to medium-sized corporations, are very weary about navigating the H-1B process. Um, even as a smaller nonprofit organizations, we have invested and identified individuals to, to do H-1B applications because we feel, felt it was important to draw in more talent. So I think that's a one fundamental challenge is that our companies locally, um, if we can work with them more in terms of understanding that process. We, Please add, Larry. We, we've actually, uh, at Global Cleveland, worked with uh, some companies that are expanding globally and need some of that skill. Uh, to at least uh, tap to, in, in the first instance, to tap into international talent, international students during their intern years while they're here studying. And then we also have a program where we go out and talk to employers. Uh, we're going to be delivering it this fall to human resources professionals around the region where we talk to them about the H-1B visa uh, process and other visa processes uh, that uh, employers can leverage to uh, employ uh, graduates after graduation. And um, you know, so far we've had a very favorable response, but we want them to know that there are resources available. It's not as complicated as a process you, as you might think. And there are tremendous advantages inside of an organization when you actually take those steps. Dan, from, from your vantage point as a large employer, what makes it hard to attract young professionals to Cleveland or retain young professionals to Cleveland? Sure, I think Andrew and Michael hit the nail on the head. Part of it is reputation. I, I would say that um, the low-hanging fruit, though, is the retention piece, again, creating stronger partnerships between the local companies and the universities where, where peop young people are already here. Keep them here before they go to Chicago or New York or elsewhere in the country. Um, in terms of what makes it challenging is, is just that, you know, creating those networks, and I think that's an important part of what Global Cleveland is doing, as Larry mentioned. Um, I'd say that's probably the major thing. I would say, you know, when you look at um, the, you know, globally, this is all about kind of plugging Cleveland back into the global talent network, if you will, and making Cleveland a, a place that uh, people want to go. Um, you know, if you look at 
where we are economically in the world right now, there's a need for leadership right now. There's, there's economic leadership. There's a lot of uncertainty right now. There are still people that are in other parts of the country that might have um, you know, mortgages where they're underwater on. Luckily, a lot of young people might not have that, that issue. And you look at the stats that Larry talked about in terms of number of open jobs here, this is just about being active and going out and telling the story and uh, doing job fairs outside of our region to get them back here. And so for, for companies, normally you kind of fish in the pond that you're at, in, and we just need to kind of get more fish in the pond. And the way to get there is to, is to you know, reach out uh, through what Global Cleveland does. So I want to go, Andrew, back to you um, with this. You talked about the reputation, right? So that's not just about the open, uh, lack of jobs or plenty of jobs, but it's the feel of a city. So let's be critical about where we are today as a city and a region. What do we have to do to make ourselves more attractive to young professionals and, Michael, for, also for immigrants and other newcomers? A um, couple of things come to mind. It would, uh, the first one would be that we need to engage the young people as soon as they get here. There's about a 90-day window of where somebody moves to a city and they decide if they're going to stay there or not. So, so you have a very short period of time. And so when they first get here, you have to connect them with the city very quickly. Um, and that's kind of the purpose of Engage Cleveland is to get people integrated into the nonprofits, the young professional organizations, events, programs. So you, integration of getting people into the community is very important. Um, kind of another thing is we have to remain, uh, maintain being proactive. We have to not get stuck in old ways. We have to push the ball. We have to think about you know, what can be innovative and creative, and that's exciting to younger people who want to do new things. And uh, the last piece I would say is um, Cleveland has all the assets, but it's still a bit fragmented and difficult to get around. Young people like to be in a community that's easy to get around, that's biking friendly, that has good public transportation. And right now we're quite fragmented, so you have to take a car everywhere. And so we need to continue, and we, we've started it here, but we need to continue and get a long-term plan as to how we want the city to look like from a development standpoint and as kind of a, an identity in the country. Michael, from the immigrants' perspective or the new Asian immigrants' uh, perspective, what do we need to do to make Cleveland more attractive? Very much parallel to some of the challenges in, in attracting and retaining young professionals. I think with the immigrant communities, there's a couple things I can highlight. One is around community cues. I mean, I think recently I saw, I noticed at Cleveland Hopkins Airport the signage were in different languages, and that was kind of different for me. And in, a, in some ways, those kind of subtle cues throughout our communities have a very strong impression in terms of um, providing a welcoming and receiving um, environment for, for newcomers. The second piece that I would um, highlight is the importance of building ethnic community infrastructures. And that means we need to really connect with our development and planning activities at the local level. This is about investing in the ideas around ethnic enclave business businesses so that there's not just one Chinese restaurant, but there's a Chinese restaurant that's Cantonese serving, um, serving Hunan style or Peking style. That's the kind of stuff like in San Jose, just outside of San Jose, there's a large Chinese community. If you go to that area, their local shopping area, they have like seven or eight different ethnic cuisines that are Chinese of different um, regions. And that's what we need to go towards. And that's an important metrics for determining if this community is ready to be receiving of newcomers. So assuming that we can make some of these changes, Larry, um, how do we get the word out? You know, so part, part of this is getting the word back out. Uh, Dan talked about the need to have a larger pond to fish in. How do, what are some of the strategies that you and partners have thought about? So I think there's a number of them, Beiju. Um, some of them are very simple and uh, just um, as simple as people leveraging networks and relationships that people have. So person-to-person -person contact, talking to people about, do you have members of your family? Do you have members, uh, friends? Do you have members of your professional organization or your church, synagogue, or uh, mosque that you can contact and invite to Cleveland um, or you know, uh, tell about what's going on in Cleveland? So some of it's that simple, just leveraging existing relationships. Um, some of it is using uh, the media, using uh, social media, using the internet to uh, push uh, messages out. And um, it's very important also to uh, just build networks. So for example, we have an initiative to attract boomerangers to Cleveland, people who lived in Cleveland, went other places, and we're trying to get them back. And all of you in this room can help us uh, in that initiative by identifying people we might be able to attract back. And the very first thing we're trying to do is to organize those connectors here in Cleveland as a community. And 
and, and then put them to work uh, to attract those boomerangers back. Well, Larry, uh, sorry, yeah. go ahead, Dan, no, please. I was going to say, I mean, it's really a competitive in, in, in imperative, too, for our city. When you think about a lot of the demographic shifts that are occurring throughout the world and throughout our country, um, we can remain kind of closed and unwelcoming, but it's at our own peril. This is really something where we say, hey, to be economic, economically competitive, we need to be welcoming and open and, and embrace people with open arms. But I neglected to uh, mention another one that's going on right now, actually. Uh, on behalf of local employers, we're going to work sector by sector, and we've been working uh, with the biomedical industry uh, to create online virtual job fairs. And so we did one a few weeks ago. We're doing a second one today on behalf of 35 companies. Uh, they, uh, last time we uh, did this, we had over 200 jobs posted out on the website. We had over 8,000 visitors come to that site. Over 2,000 people apply for jobs. Many people locally and from other uh, parts of the country uh, have been placed in those positions since that job fair. So um, we're going to continue to develop that technology and that approach as a way of letting people know that there is opportunity in Northeast Ohio. And, I, and as I can, I'll speak for the, the smaller employers, this really works for the small companies because they can hunt as a pack. There's 35 companies going to market together, whether they're going to New Jersey or Michigan or Illinois or Seattle to recruit candidates here, and it makes the proposition of moving here that much easier for a candidate that's considering moving him or herself and their, and their family. Now, I talk a little bit about you know, as we close the moderated part of the discussion about the partnerships that you are establishing to achieve your objectives with, of course, Andrew Bennett and Engage Cleveland, but also Michael and uh, Asia Inc. It's, it's not our uh, objective at Global Cleveland to build a huge infrastructure inside of our own organization. There are a lot of wonderful people and organizations that are also already working in the space that we're working in, and we want to leverage as many of those resources as we possibly can. So um, in some cases, we will identify an opportunity or a problem, and there's something unique that we will do as Global Cleveland, but we try to bring all these other experts and partners together. So Asia Inc., as you said, Engage Cleveland. Uh, we work with um, colleges and universities in the area with employers, uh, with uh, social service agencies, um, you know, all the members of our board bring their organizations to bear on what we're doing. Our funders have been tremendous in not just their financial support, but also lending us their encouragement and their intellectual knowledge of, uh, about um, uh, issues in the community and their relationships. So. Uh, it's a lot of partnership and a lot of working together, and that's one of the most satisfying aspects of this work, is to see just how much that's happening around this issue in Northeast Ohio. Thank you. Today at the City Club of Cleveland, we're listening to a Friday forum discussing Global Cleveland with Global Cleveland representatives, Larry Miller, Dan Walsh, Andrew Bennett, Michael Bann, and moderated by Beju Shaw. We will return to our panel in a moment for our traditional City Club question and answer period. Please go ahead and formulate your questions now. Remember to keep them brief. We welcome all of you here and those listening to 90.3 WCPN. Idea Stream, WCLV, WTAM, or one of the many radio stations across the country. Our television broadcast partner is WVIZ PBS Idea Stream. Television broadcasts of the City Club are made possible by Cleveland State University and PNC. Our live webcast is supported by the University of Akron. Next Friday, June 29th, the City Club welcomes Jim Tressel, Vice President for Strategic Engagement at the University of Akron. For more information about our upcoming forums or to see how to order a CD or DVD of today's program uh, or to listen to a podcast of any past program, please visit our website, www.cityclub.org. We'd like to welcome guests today at tables hosted by BioEnterprise and Global Cleveland. Thank you for your support. Now we'd like to return to our panel for our traditional City Club question and answer period. We welcome questions from everybody here, including guests. And holding the microphone today is City Club Program Director, Carrie Miller. First question, please. I apologize if I've missed this, but uh, I've heard nothing at all about the possibilities of the effect of the political environment in Cleveland. What has its effect, has been its effect in the past, the present, and potentially for the future? 
Andrew, do you want to uh, talk a little bit about the change in the political sure. environment? <laughs> I'll pass it on to Dan over there. <laughs> <laughs> Do you want to start with that? Sure. No, I, I think um, one thing, I'm glad that's a great question, and I think it's important to note that when Global Cleveland was being formulated, there was great involvement from Mayor Jackson, County Executive Fitzgerald. So I think that's the most important thing, you know, really to talk about the present and the future of the endorsement and support that they've given to this. So um, as it relates to our local support to make sure this initiative works, uh, there is uh, great financial and political support. And do you want to talk a little bit about the next generation council that the county executive has formed? Yeah. Um, in the last about a year ago, we worked with County Executive Ed Fitzgerald on establishing uh, kind of a young advisory council called Next Generation Council. And its purpose is to help give uh, advice from the young professional viewpoint to Cuyahoga County and what they're looking to uh, to achieve and where they hope the county goes. So working, there's a lot of young people who are actually very interested in getting involved in politics and um, a lot of times they don't know how to, but now that more and more organization has started, people feel like they have a voice and they can get more involved. And so there's an organization called Young Professional Senate that's out there that uh, does this every week and that's kind of their main goal is to get more and more people involved in uh, politics in the, uh, in the community uh, conversation. Uh, certainly the goals of uh, your organization are outstanding, and each of you articulates them beautifully. Uh, they seem to resolve around uh, trying to rejuvenate Cleveland by bringing young people back and urging young people to come and involves jobs. Uh, unfortunately, in the last couple of decades, uh, Cleveland has lost a large number of jobs, uh, particularly to uh, Asia, where the costs of doing business are so much light slighter and uh, importing those goals to this country is also very uh, inexpensive. I'm thinking of the clothing industry in particular. It's one time was a major employer with tens of thousands of employees in Cleveland, all gone now. Uh, a lot of this, we th I think, is, reflects the free trade policies we have. And to what extent do you think that if our free trade policies were changed to one more of fair trade, in which uh, goods that are brought in from overseas uh, would pay a tariff of some kind to reflect the difference in cost between doing the business in Asia and doing business in Cleveland. Would that improve uh, the job picture in Cleveland? Well, I'm going to um, take the moderator's privilege. I'm not sure that any of us are qualified to answer that question, but maybe we can answer a different question about the, the gentleman makes, I think, accurate reference to sort of the shift in industries that are occurring, the loss of jobs that had occur, uh, been here historically. Larry, talk a little bit about the employers that you do see that are seeking talent today and what types of jobs those are, as well as, you know, what types of growth those employers are experiencing. We do talk to employers and, um, you know, I think one of the one of the answers is that uh, there's a lot of work being done to attract new companies to Northeast Ohio. We've had some recent successes in in, in that regard. A number of the organizations that may have uh, moved uh, manufacturing and activity overseas are now starting to talk to us about reshoring it back to uh, Northeast Ohio, um, and um, so there is a lot of that kind of uh, conversation uh, and so in some of the strategic areas uh, that we have identified as an economy in Northeast Ohio that we want to focus on, there are new skill sets that employers are trying to hire people in. And so in the biotech industry, in the energy industry, in some of the advanced materials industries, we're seeing employers in those spaces saying that their organizations are on the grow, that uh, their talent needs are on the grow, and they're asking us for help uh, in that regard. Good afternoon. Uh, I've been listening to the conversation, and two things I haven't heard. Uh, declining wage rates, which is an issue that really impacts this area. We talk about attracting talent and employees that have skill sets that are unique to certain industries. We have a declining wage rate in this area, so how are you going to address that? And also the debt burden for students, uh, college students. We have a number of students who are pursuing higher education, advanced degree education, and the burden of debt is weighing, weighing down on them. So how do you plan to initiate policy and partnerships that are going to impact that to make Cleveland more attractive? Dan, sure. Uh, I, I think, um, again, it's, it's kind of a similar situation where you look at the, uh, 
the overall economy of, of Cleveland right now, our unemployment rate is below 7% relative to the national average at, you know, north of 8. So right now there are, there, there's, the economy overall is improving faster than the national average. And so I think it goes back to the point around the diversification of the economy that has occurred, the re, remaking of that economy. There are individual decisions in terms of what people get paid and what jobs are open. Larry mentioned that there are, uh, you know, 90,000 open jobs in Northeast Ohio, uh, in, you know, I think advertised, advertised right now in, in, the, uh, in the area. And so um, you kind of look at that. Global Cleveland, you know, isn't making policy around wages or anything like that. It's truly trying to connect uh, employers and people to opportunities. With regard to the uh, debt uh, burden for students, kind of same thing. You know, this is a set of rules that everybody in the country is playing by. So really what we're looking at strategically is trying to find ways to make it work to our advantage to uh, attract people here and say, well, geez, if you have a debt burden in one of the 24-hour you know, cities where your rent is 2000 or $3,000 a month, come to Cleveland and pay 500 And that for, you know, therefore you have, you know, some money available to pay back that debt more quickly. So I think those are some of the things that we're really trying to do to maybe indirectly market Cleveland and position Cleveland as a way to take advantage of a lot of those issues that are out there to make sure it drives economic development in our city. One of the things that I remember digging into the data, not this morning, but a couple months ago, about those 90,000 open jobs or postings that are across the region is about half of those positions require a college degree or higher. So there, there certainly are a number of positions that are open for individuals that have the appropriate qualifications to come. And I would echo Dan's point about the cost of living in terms of addressing the debt burden issue. It's about both making money as well as obviously reducing the expense side. Thanks. Good afternoon. Jonathan Hollifield. I applaud uh, the efforts of Global Cleveland, but I do have a question. And it goes to Michael's point about subtle cues. In terms of the talent attraction thrust, how diverse are we exploring in terms of global talent attraction? Is this just about immigrant talent or is it about national migratory talent as well? And how perhaps do we continue to use the right conjunction? Not immigrant or, but immigrant and. Great. Larry, do you want to start with that? And sure, sure. I mean, I, we are absolutely dedicated to both, to maximizing the sourcing of talent here locally, to maximizing the talent, uh, the access and sourcing of talent from other places around uh, the United States, and accessing talent uh, from overseas. So when we sit down and talk to employers about the talent that they need and they're not available to find locally today, we start brainstorming about other sources and we look at you know, ways we might bring that talent in from other places in the United States and other places overseas. Um, we have started to meet with and have conversations with different groups in our community, the Latino community, the Asian community, and others about ways we can leverage their relationships, again, with people in other cities, uh, the Asian community in San Francisco, the Asian community in the, the East Coast, uh, the Latino community in New York City, to uh, attract um, you know, uh, those communities, those ethnic communities here in Northeast Ohio, and uh, eventually start reaching out uh, even overseas. Uh, can you also just make a comment for Mr. Hallfield about the HBCU effort that you guys are planning? I'm sorry, the, the H HBCU. Historically black colleges oh, and universities. Sorry. Sorry. Okay. Um, I call them traditionally black. So, uh, um, so we are, as part of, for example, the uh, job fairs that we're currently doing, um, one of the things we can uh, work with is where we market those two. So we want to make sure that as we're doing that, we are reaching out and um, marketing our job fairs to traditionally uh, black, minority, Latino uh, colleges and universities around the country. So that's uh, something we're actively uh, working on. And we're also talking about going and doing face-to-face -face job fairs at some of those universities and places like Puerto Rico um, to attract talent. Michael. You know, this whole story around the immigrant communities, it's, I think it's a little bit more complex than thinking about immigrants as being all coming from, um, for, they're foreign-born or coming to this country because, in fact, we're within the immigrant community, specifically in the Asian community, which recently the Pew Research Center has shared that it's the fastest growing ethnic community in the country. What we also are faced with is immigrants have children that have lived here for many years and have become citizens, and they're part of that brain drain population of young pe professionals that have lit, lit, left the area. So in, t in terms of the work that we do, it's not only about 
looking at new arrivals foreign born but also immigrant children who are now citizens and are living in other parts of this country that are talented and they should be back to help support this mm -hmm. country. My question uh, sort of follows the last one. Um, when Global Cleveland was being created, it was my impression from public meetings like this or from press reports that the emphasis was going to be on facilitating immigrants or people who may be recent immigrants to the United States but maybe not directly from a foreign country to get to know about Cleveland and come to Cleveland and add to our workforce. There seems to have been a shift to more of the boomeranger thing, which is very necessary, but I thought it wasn't necessarily the agenda of greater of Global Cleveland. Your title seems to imply that differently. Um, so my question is twofold. Well, I have, let me give it another example. The other example I have is I get your periodic email, and the last several, at least, emphasize, emphasize boomerangers first. I think that's a great story, but I'd like to hear about what's going on with residents from other countries that are coming too. Um, and I, the last one, frankly, I looked at and said, same old story, goodbye, you know, won't listen to that one again. Um, so I'd kind of like to know what the priorities are and what the real connections are locally to the current immigrant communities in Cleveland or ethnic communities in Cleveland other than the Asian community, which Michael's represented very well. So, uh, Dan, let me throw this your way to start, and then to Larry. Uh, Dan, if you want to talk a little bit about the focus of Global Cleveland in terms of our audiences, and then, Larry, if you want to address the, the back half of the question in terms of the connections to the communities. Sure, and I think it's a great point. I would say that uh, uh, while Gro Global Cleveland was being created, we had very, uh, and continue to have very broad-based support from all the different ethnic communities in town, many of which are also um, represented through Engage Cleveland. A lot of the people that are part of Engage Cleveland are also part of the ethnic groups that are supporting Global Cleveland. So when you started to kind of connect those dots between Engage and the ethnic communities, um, you know, you had a, a powerful force there from, from young professionals and from the ethnic communities. Mm -hmm. I would say overall, though, the, it, the, the scope continued to broaden a little bit when you look at it from an economic development perspective that um, it's a much more inclusive. We're, we're, Cleveland's about being inclusive and welcoming to anybody who wants to come here. And so it is not an either or proposition. I think we talked about the right conjunctions, it's and. So I think that um, what we realized was truly to, to make sure that all of Cleveland was on board, that it wasn't just kind of a uh, support of different ethnic groups, but to make sure all of Cleveland was on board to support the success of this, it was important to make sure that it was, was all inclusive. Otherwise, it's gonna be tough to be successful without broad-based support. And so that was really what has driven the, this, and it's blossomed, really, with the support. Larry, do you want to talk a little bit about the connections to the ethnic communities beyond uh, just the Asian community? I mean, we believe absolutely in both paths, pursuing all paths, and um, so we are absolutely working with uh, all the different, as many of the different uh, international communities as we possibly can. We had conversations and attend events, uh, you know, several times uh, every week um, to reach out to uh, the Serbian community, to the Latino community, to um, uh, the Asian community, uh, any one of a number of different um, uh, communities in town. Uh, I'm, the, I'm involved with the, the French American uh, community here in uh, Northeast Ohio as well. Um, I work with, uh, for example, I work with job seekers at uh, our Welcome Hub downtown. I'm working with about a dozen job seekers today. About half of those are immigrants, so there is you know, uh, we are working with uh, with that population, but we are trying to work with the various groups in town, um, uh, and we are also working with a, a group or organized around refugees uh, to try to encourage uh, refugee um, movement into Northeast Ohio and to promote it and to promote col collaboration among the refugee support organizations in town. Let's talk a little bit more about refugees, because for most of the conversation we've talked about filling the open jobs, attracting young professionals, talent, immigrants with talent. But Michael, you and, and Larry both uh, work a lot with refugee populations that are coming into Cleveland. Tell the audience a, a little bit more about these populations and what skills they're bringing into our region. Absolutely. Um, so I think for most folks, I mean, it's um, may not have the correct, you know, may not know the right definition of refugees versus immigrants. But refugees have a unique category in terms of those are folks from war-prone crisis areas that come here not by choice, whereas immigrants come here to reunite with family, 
for professional opportunities and educational attainment. So here in Ohio, we annually re receive around 1,800 refugees, and most recently in the last several years have been primarily from Bhutan and from Burma. And these individuals, uh, of the 1,800 that do resettle here in Ohio, um, around 45 to 55% of them land right here in the Cuyahoga Summit Stark Corridor. And so one of the important things about understanding the fact that we have this refugee community, we often think of refugees coming with limited assets, but the reality is they have tremendous assets and um, gifts to offer this community. And we're seeing that um, you know, face, face forward in terms, of, um, in terms of agricultural work and activities, really being part of the local foods movement. There's some agricultural, refugee agricultural farm projects that are coming up all around the region. Good afternoon, Holly Harris, University of Akron. Uh, and my question was a little bit in alignment with what you had just asked, um, which was um, for those of us who in higher education and a lot of the other organizations that we work with who have been in the space of attraction, education, retention, I was trying to have a better understanding, Larry, about what's the value added that Global Cleveland brought to what everyone is doing. And so I'll, I'll leave it kind of at that. Um, my president, Louise Prenz, will be first to say, I'll, Holly also has an answer for the question she just gave you, and I do. Um, and, <laughs> and, and so I want to see how you respond to that. But based upon a couple of other people ask questions, I have a thought as well, because there is a real needed value added that we haven't been able to achieve yet. So I'll leave that with you, and then I'll throw out one more piece, if I may. So Larry, if you want to talk a little bit about your work with, in particular, the international student offices at uh, various institutions of higher education, yeah, so I, I think a lot of what we bring is uh, we, we are working with um, a lot of uh, colleges and universities in the area. We're trying to help them um, put together programs to welcome international students when they get here, make sure that they have that good experience in the first 60, 90 to days and really connect with the area, that um, we're working to develop mentoring programs and um, uh, other kinds of programs to provide support to international students while they're here. We try to help them uh, work with the universities to help them uh, identify uh, opportunities for internships and employment uh, after they uh, graduate. And I think the value add uh, we bring is uh, by, you know, we can do more if we all work together rather than working independently. So we try to be a bridge among different organizations, different resources uh, in the community, even among different universities working together. And so I think that's, that's the but primary part response. Of it, part of it, Larry, is also your work with employers. Right. I mean, and employers in terms of hiring international students. So tell, tell us a little bit more about what you're doing on the employer side to match to this student pipeline that's coming out of our institutions. Right. So again, we have you know, relationships with a lot of employers in the region. We have what we call our talent advisory group, which are senior uh, human resources. Uh, leaders from a number of organizations around uh, town and other relationships that we have uh, with uh, people in human resources. Um, and so we talk to them on a regular basis about, um, uh, you know, uh, work, uh, hiring uh, uh, and, and, and the HR staff. Uh, we talk to them about um, uh, hiring international students as interns, hiring them as uh, full-time employees. Uh, we try to make sure that as they let us know of needs that they're going to have in the future, that also the colleges and universities know that as well, so they can anticipate and find students who are appropriate for those needs. Dan, you have something to add to that? Yeah, no, I just, you know, as a, as a banker, I talk to a lot of companies around the region, and I often ask the question, you know, how is it finding talent? And inevitably, the answer is it's really, really hard. And so this is about building awareness of and connections between the University of Akron and, and those employers saying, you know, making sure that those dots are connected. And I'm sure University of Akron is working very hard to connect with employers. Whatever we can do to supplement that and not replace it is what really, really what Global Cleveland is about. Andrew? Yeah, in, in addition to that, I think with Global Cleveland and Engage Cleveland, it's about that connectivity piece. So it shouldn't be go to college, graduate, stop, then you're in the real world, figure out what you're going to be doing. It's, you should be establishing relationships with the community, the organizations that are out there, the activities, while they're in college, so it becomes more of a tr kind of a seamless transition and not so much you know, that stop and go, but it just is a continuation. And if you do that, people are more likely to stay here and then get jobs and get internships and have a, you know, a friend base and a base of people that they can reach out to or mentors. So I think it's about, you know, it always comes back to me about connectivity and communication. Usually when something is failing, it's around that communication piece. Um, so I think that's where Global Cleveland and Engage Cleveland will really be a, a big benefit is on that connectivity and communication. 
It's a great dialogue to be having. And uh, growing up in the Collinwood area in the 60s and 70s, I felt like on my street, I lived uh, in an international street, so uh, somewhat second nature to me. Um, the, the discussion about soft cues really hit me because when we, we had exchange students uh, from Germany four years, and we saw things through their eyes and things that didn't seem important to us that we grew up with, it wasn't a big deal. So how do we take some of those soft things out and use them in a way, in addition to jobs and opportunities and so forth, to expose them to other people? For example, the cultural gardens. If you bring someone from, uh, for us, it's a, it's a shortcut to get to University Circle. But if you view that through the eyes of some international visitors, they want to stop, they want to pull over, can we walk around? And uh, the Cleveland International uh, Hall of Fame event, four or five hundred people growing every year. Collinwood's uh, own George Voinovich, uh, one of the early inductees, sister city programs. Uh, jobs are important and all that, but some of the soft things are very important too. Please. You know, um, I think that's a great question. And, I, um, you know, there's a lot of examples in our community of things that are already being done very successfully to attract different parts of the com newcomer community. And a good example I would cite is the University of Akron. I mean, they have unusual number of Thai and Saudi students that come. And there's a reason why they come. So I guess the, the important thing is to go in there and figure out what are the ingredients that are bringing those folks to their, for that, along that same line of thinking, there are corporations, there's a um, light industry corporation down south in Summit County they have a large disproportionate population of workers who are from Southeast Asia. And so it probably started with maybe a handful of them starting work there, and the employers have began to build relationships and understanding how to work with them, and there were more and more coming to work with that company. So that's what we need to do is to really explore within our communities because it's already happening, and look at models and see how, what, what, what does it take to make that happen. Yeah, uh, gentlemen, from what I see, by far the greatest growth industry in this area is healthcare. Uh, and uh, I didn't hear you ask or talk very much about that, but can you, specific, can you be specific as to the steps you are uh, taking to uh, attract uh, both international and domestic uh, uh, persons particularly graduates from local universities uh, to fit into the needs of the healthcare industry uh, in, this, in this area. Thank you for the question. You would think that the bioenterprise table was my plant, but that was my plant. <laughs> so um, I'll talk about one program and then I'll have Larry talk about uh, another program called the Pathways because healthcare is a, a major sector. We would think of ourselves as perhaps the defining sector for Cleveland's economic uh, growth. And one of the programs we are embarking on right now, it's actually live this week, is this job fair that Larry mentioned. Because our companies, on the company side of healthcare, are growing at a rate that's faster than the ability of our local institutions to continue to produce the talent to meet the needs. So it's not that our local institutions, like the University of Akron and Case Western, aren't great institutions. It's just that the companies are growing that fast that we've got to be able to attract talent from elsewhere. So we've been pooling these biomedical employers together onto what's known as an online job fair, and we market that job fair out to regions where we know there are large concentrations of biomedical professionals. Think of New Jersey in the pharmaceutical corridor or Chicago with all of the medical device companies. And we advertise through these social networks and industry networks that the, there are these open positions, and we've had a tremendous response. In our first job fair in March, we had 2,500 2, applicants for the 250 open positions that were being posted at that time. This week, we've got another 210 positions that are being posted, and as of yesterday, we already had 1,700 applicants for those positions. So that this is part of attracting the talent in on the industry side. Now, on the delivery side of healthcare, our large and wonderful clinical institutions, it's that, it's attracting talent, but there's also talent that's right here in our midst that can be trained to work or is already trained to work in those environments, but is might not yet be certified. And so, Larry, if you could say a word about the Pathways program. Sure. Uh, thanks, Beju. The uh, very first program that we deployed as Global Cleveland was uh, based around a need that we identified in talking to 
um, people in uh, the hospitals here in Northeast Ohio. We have a couple of members, uh, representatives of the Cleveland Clinic University Hospitals on our board, and we have regular conversations with uh, other members of their leadership teams of other hospitals and uh, human resources teams in other hospitals around the region on a regular basis. We identified a need that they're looking for all sorts of um, uh, medical help, and we also heard people telling us at the same time that there were uh, immigrants in our region who were trained overseas as medical professionals, doctors, nurses, uh, other kinds of professions, dentists, um, who had immigrated to the United States, were permanent residents, were able to work, but had not yet gotten into the medical profession, into the medical uh, sector in Northeast Ohio. So uh, a member of our team, Roya Ismail Beghi Shirazi, and some others uh, she worked with, she developed a team of uh, uh, partners that we work with, the State Board of Regents and Cleveland State University and others, put together a program to help them with their English, to uh, help them uh, get their credentials from overseas translated and reviewed here locally, to uh, introduce them to the hospitals, to introduce them to hospital and medical practice in the United States. So we've graduated now uh, 18 of those uh, professionals and we're working now to uh, get them placed and um, we're very excited about this program, and in fact, the State Board of Regents has agreed to fund two more installments of that program uh, this fall, one here in Cleveland again, and another one in the Akron area. Today at the City Club of Cleveland, we've been listening to a special forum featuring a panel discussion on Global Cleveland. Thank you to our wonderful panel. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. This forum is now adjourned. <laughs>